Welcome to Sandwell and West Birmingham NHS Hospitals Managing Physical Aggression Training. The aim of our session today is to provide an enhanced level of knowledge about managing aggression in acute NHS settings. We will be looking at the following objectives. Consider how the physical environment can affect our safety. Assess specific risks and methods for managing intoxicated individuals. Reflect on advanced communication strategies. Consider which positions and stances can decrease our risk of injury when working. Listen to the law in relation to using force as part of our role. And consider how knowledge of the Mental Health Act and Mental Capacity Act affect our safety at work. Objective 1. Consider how the physical environment can affect our safety. There are, mul there are multiple basic steps that we can take in order to make our environment safer to work in. These steps, these steps are cost-free and require no special training or knowledge. Take the following room as an example. In our bed we have our patient, Stuart. By the bed we have a table, a drip stand, and an OBS machine. Where we look at the room, the door entrance is halfway along. Imagine a staff member comes to work in the room. They are stood now, as you can see, on the far side of the bed. Obviously, this produces a problem. In order to leave the room, the staff member has to take a long exit. Our patient, with a known history of aggression and sociopathic tendencies, however, only has a small distance to cover in order to get to the door and obstruct the staff member's ability to exit. We can start to think about and manage risk in these situations by looking at safe spaces that we can stand along the bedside. Imagine that the bed space can be split into three zones of safety. The green zone, covering the head and from the shoulders up. The amber zone, covering the bottom of the bed where the feet are and the red zone, the middle third of the bed. The green zone is a relatively safe space to work from because the patient cannot mobilise his limbs in order to attack. When stood in this space, the patient will not be able to instantaneously strike us with large amounts of force. The amber zone at the lower end of the bed is relatively safe to work in, providing that we are cautious. In the amber zone, you will see that a patient may swing his or her leg and be able to catch us on the lower part of our body. Potentially, this could be painful, but it is unlikely to produce serious damage. However, in the red zone, the patient has the ability to utilise all four limbs to attack us and also can raise their legs up high enough to hit us in the face. In this zone, it is vital that we are constantly vigilant and indeed that we don't go in there unless absolutely necessary. We should also consider the way the room is organised in itself. Taking the layout of the room, in this case we could make some simple differences that would have a big impact. For example, we may move the bedside table over to the opposite side and we may adjust the position of any drip stands or other equipment. We now have the situation where a room of the same size can be utilised far more safely from a staff point of view. A staff member may now work in the green zone, on the door side of the room, and have a safe point of exit should they require it. A further factor to consider whilst caring for a patient like Stuart is whether or not we need to be stood alongside the bed at all. Standing at the foot of the bed is the safest place to stand as we are out of reach of all limbs and all striking distances. This, however, is only possible when a verbal exchange is taking place rather than hands-on care. Other considerations can now be given to visiting time. When Stuart's friends, Lois and Peter, come to visit, they can be sat on the opposite side of the bed. If we place the chairs here, it is likely these are the positions that they will adopt. When Lois and Peter are sat on this side of the bed, 
we are able to have a clear conversation with them. We can keep both of them in our eye line. In the event that either of them becomes aggressive, we have the bed acting as a partial shield. And we are still closest to the door in the event of an emergency. In situations where we know a patient has a tendency to react violently or aggressively without warning, it can also be worth considering keeping the bedside rail up. In this situation, upon entering the room, where the bedside rail is up, it is harder for the patient to immediately leave their bed and begin to attack us. This strategy has limitations in that the patient may simply be able to drop the bedside back down, however it is a consideration that is worth bearing in mind. Where it is inevitable that somebody must work in the red zone on the far side of the bed from the door, always consider whether a colleague could be a useful addition. The purpose of your colleague is to talk to the patient and watch out for any warning or danger signs the patient may start to display. In the event the patient does become aggressive, the colleague is able to assist in ensuring that you can safely remove yourself from the situation. A further consideration needs to be given to the physical space that we use in family rooms or meeting rooms. Take for example the layout of the room we have here. Upon entering the room, there is a table directly in front of us. The main space in the room is off to the left hand side. It is foreseeable when dealing with family members that we may end up in the following position. In this position we have a number of limitations. Firstly, we are not able to see all the people we are talking to. Secondly, in the event that this became an aggressive situation, we have almost zero chance of getting ourselves to the door and removing ourselves from the room before the situation escalated. Consider the following simple readjustment of the room. The table, now moved to the left-hand side, produces a central point of focus for the family members. As we, the staff member, enter the room, we are in a position where we are able to see all family members. In the event of an emergency, this is a much easier situation to manage than we saw in the previous picture. If in doubt, when going into rooms with family members or people who appear agitated, Always follow the after you principle. After you simply allows the other person to enter the room first. It is deemed courteous, but crucially, you will always remain in control of the door. As the other person walks into the room, they will move further away. As you enter the room, you are stood in the doorway or just behind the door. Also consider in room layout where panic alarms may be situated. We want to ensure that the panic alarms are always within our reach and that we do not have to overcome any physical obstructions in order to get to them. Consider as well that rooms that are going to be used in order to manage patients who are potentially distressed or intoxicated need to be as furniture free as possible. The fewer objects that are in a room that can move, the fewer things that can obviously be thrown at us. Finally, consider the possibility of delaying the treatment or intervention where possible in the event that you are dealing with an aggressive person. Remember, refusing to treat someone is very different to simply saying, I do not feel it is safe to treat them right now. If it is a non-urgent, non-life-threatening situation, you may wish to pause for a period of time that is deemed appropriate before returning to the patient to see if their behaviour or mood has changed. Objective 2. Assess specific risks and methods for managing intoxicated individuals. Managing intoxicated individuals requires a degree of knowledge in terms of how we communicate and also knowledge in terms of how we behave ourselves. It is very easy to become judgmental if we routinely deal with people who are intoxicated. The patients that we see most often are the ones that we are most likely to miss something when we look at them. It is vital that when we deal with people who are under the influence of drugs or alcohol that our personal attitude remains calm, professional and non-judgmental. Self-awareness of this is the first important step that we need to take. 
on top of our calm, professional and non-judgmental manner, we also need to try and think about other behavioural techniques we can use to manage intoxication. The first one is to consider if we can seek collateral information from a third party. Is there a relative, a friend or somebody accompanying the individual who we can take a history from or at least collaborate with in order to try and establish the best history possible? By doing this we maximise the probability that we will gain a full and clear account of the circumstances that have led the person to being in front of us. It is also important that we try and orientate and establish rapport with the individual. We must communicate clearly, slowly and simply. You may have noticed, if you have experience of managing intoxication before, that individuals may take several seconds or longer to respond to the most simplistic questions. Allowing this time to answer may seem annoying given the time pressures and constraints that we are under. However, this time is an upfront investment by getting the correct information and as much information as we can as quickly as possible we are more likely to be able to speed up the treatment process. Wherever possible a good technique is to allocate a single worker rather than have multiple staff members which can cause confusion try to maintain consistency as far as possible. However there can be times where an intoxicated individual decides that they do not like a particular staff member. This can be for any reason or no reason at all. It is sometimes appropriate to consider switching so a different staff member becomes the point of contact for an individual patient. Where a patient is agitated and has a dislike for a particular staff member, continuing to expose the staff member and the patient to that scenario is likely to produce conflict. Wherever possible, we should look to try and put the person who is intoxicated in an area where there is a low level of external stimuli. Often this may not be possible, however it is a consideration that should always be borne in mind. A strong cause of agitation for a person who is intoxicated is belittlement or being provoked. This can be done by staff either consciously or unconsciously. The fact that we see something on a regular basis can start to prove irritating for ourselves as staff members. However, once our professional standards slip, this is highly likely to produce aggression in an already agitated drunk person. Specific behavioural techniques for managing drunkenness. Pacing. Pace the interaction at the intoxicated patient's level of cognitive impairment. Keywords. Key words may be all that is recognised by the intoxicated patient. Therefore, avoid negative key words. Instead of saying, stop being difficult, use positive ones. We need to work together here. Distraction. This can be useful at impasses and with higher levels of intoxication. Can you get the person to talk about something simple and not related to their present situation? For example, where they grew up? what music they like, and where they went to school, and so forth. Stop and go. This is a style of interacting where you stop positive interaction at the point of unwanted behaviour. You then deliver a terse message, but return immediately to the friendly positive interaction afterwards. For example, uh, Mr Bunnell, you need to stop swearing and you need to behave nicely, now. OK, carry on telling me about your school. This mechanism provides clear intervention and sets behavioural boundaries, whilst quickly restoring the relationship afterwards. Contingency contracting. Tell the patient what they need to do and what and when they will get as a result. For example, let's make a deal. You sit still, I'll get your wound cleaned up, then you're going to be able to go. Right, but we've got to work together on this. Can you do that for me? In this situation, we are trying to ensure that the individual understands why it is in their interest to comply with us. Equally, it is in our interest for them to comply with us also. In this situation, we are trying to ensure that we establish the fastest and most efficient working relationship possible. Withdraw or time out. 
This is where staff withdraw and return later on. It can help at impasses and enable staff to compose themselves. Sometimes walking away works well to allow a situation to dissipate. Remember, when dealing with a person who is intoxicated, consider if they are also an IV drug user. Beware that potential sharps or needles may be about their person or in bags. Always ask an individual if they have anything upon them that could cause you harm. There is no magic cure for managing intoxication. However, the briefly discussed articles and items here may provide useful to you. Objective 3. Reflect on advanced communication strategies. Already with your standard conflict resolution training, you will be familiar with a range of communication tools that can be used to de-escalate conflict. For the advanced training, it is important to recognise a few extra items of knowledge. These come under the heading of tactical communication. With tactical communication, the first thing to bear in mind is that we have to communicate with a person as or before we start moving towards them. When we are moving towards them from the green circle towards the red, we will tell them who we are, why we are entering and what we are coming to do. Remember that when in close confinement, people can feel very uncomfortable and this advanced warning makes a big difference in their perception of who we are and what we are doing. A second concept in tactical communication is in the language and the words that we use. When we are faced with a person becoming physically violent towards us, it is difficult to know precisely the combination of words that we should best use to try and manage the situation. However, there are three very dependable phrases that we can use with a number of benefits. The first is very loudly to state, get back. The second, keep away. The third, where appropriate, let me go. Now, Whilst these sound like they're something from a textbook that have no application to reality, they are actually very useful statements to make. The first reason is because you are giving a person in an agitated state a very short and simple command. Get back, keep away, let me go. If the person is later arrested by the police and says that they didn't understand what you were saying, it is a hard defence for them to fall back upon. The second reason these simple phrases work very well in real life is because they influence strongly something called witness perception. People who are observing and not involved in the fracas may not understand who started it, what is going on or why it is happening. However, if they see one of the individuals in the violent situation repeatedly saying, get back, keep away, let me go, they will start to appreciate very quickly who is the aggressor and who is the victim. Not only do your short, simple commands influence the person attacking you, they also have a strong influence on any witnesses who need to quickly understand the situation as it unfolds. The third benefit of these three simple phrases is that they also have a get one free built in. By shouting, get back, keep away, let me go, you are also calling for help. Anybody who cannot directly see you, but can hear you, will understand that you are in distress. And if nothing else, out of curiosity, they will want to come and see what's going on. The final benefit of tactical communication in this sense is that it can achieve something called mental stunning. It is impossible to replicate the volume and intensity that you would use this language at in a violent situation on an audio recording. However, Shouting, get back, as loud as you possibly can, in somebody's face, may achieve something called mental stunning. Mental stunning is simply a flinch response. It may take a person a couple of seconds to regain their senses after such an enormously loud verbal command is screamed in their face. This mental stunning provides you with an opportunity to escape from the situation. Remember, get back, keep away, let me go, shouted as loudly as possible and as often as possible, can be very, very useful phrases, but they should only be reserved for emergency situations. This type of tactical communication serves a valuable purpose and cannot be underestimated.
Objective 4. Consider which positions and stances can have an impact on our safety when working. Observe the following diagram. This is called neutral stance. In neutral stance, you will see the person is assertive but unthreatening. Hands are in front of the body and the feet are shoulder width apart. You will also see a bladed stance. That means that the feet are not side by side. One foot is slightly in front of the other. This stance is useful to adopt when somebody is at the lower level of the aggression ladder. If a person is angry or upset, in this position we have our hands safely in front of us. We are not pointing at them nor showing hostile gestures. In the event of an emergency and a sudden change in the aggression shown towards us, we could still protect ourselves very efficiently from this position in a very short space of time. If the situation escalates and we are dealing with a person who is higher on the aggression ladder, then we can move to defensive stance. Defensive stance is still assertive but unthreatening and our hands are used in this position to try and calm somebody down. Importantly, we do not show our palm to the person's face. Our palm should point towards the floor as though we are bouncing a basketball. Our stance should be slightly wider for better balance and having our hands in a slightly raised position gives ourselves the opportunity to defend ourselves should an emergency arise. In conjunction with this, it is also important that we have an understanding of the fighting arc. As you can see, the fighting arc is an imaginary clock face that we are stood in the middle of. Directly ahead of us is the number 12. Directly behind of us is the number 6. The fighting arc runs between 11 and 1. This is the area that we should try and avoid when interacting with other people who are being hostile. When approaching people who are showing signs of violence and aggression, we should always aim to approach them from between 2 and 3, or 9 and 10. If we enter the circle from 6, and the person being approached does not see us, there is an increased chance of panicked aggression. It is of high importance that we understand that once we are at position 9 or 3, we are relatively safe compared to being stood at 11, 12 or 1. However, being stood at 9 or 3 does not mean that we can't get elbowed, or that if a person is to turn 90 degrees, that we won't now be facing them straight on. It is a good rule to uphold that when interacting with people, whether they be seated, lying down or standing up, moving into the arc that runs between 11 and 1 places us in great danger. Always be aware of this and try and stay away from it where you can. Objective 5 Listen to the law in relation to using force as part of our role. It is vitally important to stress from the outset that any use of force should always be an absolute last resort. Where a person can get away from a situation that involves violence, they always should. However, there can be exceptions to this principle. There are two aspects of English and Welsh law that allow us to use force to defend ourselves. The first one is a common law right to self-defence. The common law right to self-defence simply says a defendant is entitled to use reasonable force to protect themselves or others for whom they are responsible. The second act of law that allows us to use force is Section 3 of the Criminal Law Act. This states a person may use such force as is reasonable in the circumstances in the prevention of a crime. Bringing this back into plain English, here's what we need to consider. First of all, am I being harmed? Providing I have an honest belief that harm is happening to me, I am entitled to move on to the next question. How serious is the harm that is happening to me? What is the minimum that I need to do in order to protect myself? Is this action proportionate? Now imagine an individual is trying to attack you, punching, kicking, 
biting. Clearly, harm is happening. Or what is the minimum that I need to do in order to protect myself? Well, first of all, can I run away? Can I hide? Can I avoid? But let's assume that you can't. Then the minimum you may need to do could be to strike the other person back. However, you would have to ask yourself the following questions. Firstly, how big is the other person? Secondly, how big are you? Thirdly, how strong is the other person? And fourthly, how strong are you? You must start to weigh up the differences between you and your attacker. If you happen to be Eddie Hall, the world's strongest man, who is six foot three and 165 kilos, and you are being punched by a six-year-old child, to punch the child back in the face would undoubtedly be seen as unreasonable. However, if you are a five foot two inch tall female who weighs 55 kilos, and Eddie Hall was attacking you, you may well need to have a gun, a knife or a chair in order to protect yourself. The principle here is all about doing the least amount that you need to do in order to protect yourself. Linking into this is section 3 of the Criminal Law Act, which states that in addition to protecting yourself, you may also, as well as self-defence, use such force as is reasonable to prevent crime. Imagine one of your colleagues is being attacked. This would be an assault. Because your colleague is being assaulted, you have a right to prevent that assault. As such, you are simply preventing a crime. Again, the same principles apply. Am I using reasonable force? Well, harm is occurring, my colleague is being attacked. How serious is this harm? What does the person causing the harm look like? How vulnerable is my colleague? What is the minimum that I need to do in order to protect my colleague in this situation? These are all fluid concepts that must be assessed each occasion that you encounter a situation of violence. There is another idea that we must also take on board. What if I have an honest held belief that harm is about to happen but has not yet started? The law again makes a very clear statement on this. A person about to be attacked does not have to wait for their assailant to strike the first blow or fire the first shot. Circumstances may justify a preemptive strike. If an individual was walking towards you, brandishing a chair above their head, shouting, I am going to kill you, you would have an honest held belief that harm is about to happen. You would be unwise to wait for the individual to bring the chair down upon your head before starting to defend yourself. Again, the most reasonable thing to do here would be to run away, hide, evade. However, once again assuming that's not possible, you may elect to do something first before this individual strikes you. What that action would be would again depend on you, on them, on the situation and many other variables. However, in principle, you do have the right to protect yourself when you have an honest belief that you are about to be harmed. There is a further consideration about property. You are legally allowed to use force to prevent theft. Theft is a crime. However, where property is concerned, you should never ever put yourself at risk. It is far better to get a good description of the person who is removing the property and pass it on to security and the police. Remember the core principles. Number one. Do I have an honest held belief that harm is happening or about to happen? Number two, how serious is the harm that is happening or about to happen? Number three, what is the minimum that I need to do in order to protect myself or another from this harm? To reinforce the starting point though, if you are able to remove yourself safely from a situation, then that is what you should do. You should only look to use force to protect yourself and others as an absolute last resort. Objective 6. Consider how knowledge of the Mental Health Act and Mental Capacity Act affect our safety at work. It is vital when working in an acute hospital that we understand the legislation that may prevent a person from leaving the hospital itself. 
Equally, we must also understand that while sometimes we may not wish for a person to leave, we have no lawful authority to stop them. Trying to prevent people from leaving when they are entitled to is a criminal offence. The 1983 Mental Health Act is the main piece of legislation that covers the assessment, treatment and rights of people with a mental health disorder. The Mental Capacity Act, unlike the 1983 Mental Health Act, is designed to protect and empower individuals who are not diagnosed with a mental illness, but may lack the mental capacity to make their own decisions about their care and treatment at that point in time. It is a law that applies to all individuals aged 16 and over. A person who is sectioned under the Mental Health Act, who has a physical health problem, can be transferred and detained in an acute hospital. This is done in accordance with a leave of absence order under Section 17 of the Mental Health Act. A copy of the Section 17 order must be provided to the acute hospital by the Mental Health Trust, clearly stating what restrictions should be placed upon the patient. This is legally binding. A person who is sectioned under the Mental Health Act with a copy of a Section 17 order may be detained on the ward or in the department where the Section 17 order permits such action to be taken. The Mental Capacity Act has five core principles. Providing we follow the principles of the Act, we are guaranteed to be protected against any liability. The core principles are, number one, a person is assumed to have capacity. Number two, no one should be treated as unable to make a decision unless all practical steps to help them have been exhausted and shown not to work. Number three, a person can make an unwise decision. This does not necessarily mean they lack capacity. Number four, if it is decided that a person lacks capacity, then any decision taken on their behalf must be in their best interests. Number five, any decision should show that the least restrictive option or intervention is achieved. In order to establish capacity, we will conduct a capacity test. A health or social care professional assessing someone's capacity must use a two-stage test. The first question asks whether the person has an impairment or disturbance of the mind or brain. These could include dementia, delirium, intoxication through drugs or alcohol, hypoxia or severe emotional distress. They do not have to be mental illness. If the person does have an impairment or disturbance as described above, the second question is to identify how much the impairment or disturbance affects the person's ability to make a specific decision. And there are four simple questions to do this. Does the service user understand the decision to be made? Is the service user able to retain the information given about the specific decision? Can the person weigh up the consequence of making that decision? Can the person communicate the decision by any means? If the person is unable to do any one of the four questions, they would be deemed to lack capacity at the time of the assessment for that specific decision under the Mental Capacity Act. However, it is vital we remember that a person must be assumed to have capacity unless it is established that they do not. Any restraint or use of force that we use to uphold the Mental Capacity Act has to be necessary, reasonable and proportionate to the potential harm. Use of force in relation to self-harm is also an important concept to grasp in emergency or acute medicine in relation to mental capacity. If a person with full capacity states they are going to harm themselves after discharge, there are no legal grounds to detain them. This is often a surprise to staff, as most of us would assume the desire to self-harm automatically equates to a lack of capacity. Often this is the case, but before we make the decision to detain someone who threatens self-harm, we should be able to show we could see severe mental or emotional distress mental illness or intoxication through drugs and alcohol that are impairing their ability to weigh up the consequences of their decisions. 
This would now provide the grounds for detention. Where a person is acutely in the process of harming themselves, we are able to restrain them, where we have reason to believe that at that point in time they lack capacity. We can again evidence and document this in several ways, perhaps by documenting that the person was distressed prior to harm occurring, that they had presented as being mentally unwell, they were showing signs of delirium, or they have a diagnosed mental illness that was currently impacting upon their behaviour. Their behaviour was erratic prior to the harm occurring, and so forth. A final concept to understand in the use of force in emergency or acute medicine is our common law duty to prevent significant harm. There is a general common law power that allows us to take steps that are reasonably necessary and proportionate to protect others from the immediate risk of significant harm. If a patient states they are going to cause significant harm to another person after leaving the hospital, or is attempting to cause significant harm to another person whilst in the hospital, we can detain or restrain them appropriately. It is of the utmost importance that we recognise when we can and cannot detain people in the hospital environment. It is vital that we have a clear and working understanding of the Mental Health Act and the Mental Capacity Act. If you are in doubt as to whether a person has capacity or not, you must conduct the capacity assessment as given above. Capacity is always assumed unless we can prove otherwise. Thank you for completing Sandwell and West Birmingham Hospitals Managing Physical Aggression Training. The video is now complete.